this from, for the last minute uh, change of the event to pure uh, online event due, of course, to the recent surge in uh, COVID. Uh, so we have great talks today. Uh, Asaf and Rui will uh, start by giving an intro to Apache Liminal, Mike Erlikson and the history of Transformers, and lastly, Doron Bartov will share how machine learning can assist you to get rid of your car. But first, few words about us, natural intelligence. Uh, so we are a global leader in comparison uh, website and marketplaces. We are super unique in the Israeli ecosystem as we are still a bootstrap company, 12 years old, with hundreds of millions of dollars revenue. What we do best is to simplify decision-making for consumers. We turn the overchoice pain into a decision, please. How we do that? Well, we sit in the middle and we facilitate the matching between the consumer and brands. We have two main uh, domains, top10.com and bestmoney.com. Uh, and the amazing, I think, uh, uh, figure we have uh, you can see it here is the 15% per, uh, uh, conversion rate, which means that once a consumer gets to our funnel, there is 50% uh, uh, chance he will complete the action um, that we uh, design that was designed for him. And this is, of course, an amazing figure. And in the couple of uh, next slides, I will give you a, glip, a glimpse into our technologies that facilitate this uh, amazing number. So in the last few years, we've developed XMatch, uh, our proprietary multi-category technology platform. It consists of uh, four layers. Um, second. Sorry. It consists of four layers, uh, Excite, a proprietary CMS focused in web experimentation and a global serving infra. X-Factor, our brain, AI automation services, Extreme, scalable and very robust integration platform and beneath all of course x data which fuel our uh, matching capabilities um, one second few words uh, about our main initiative in data science uh, so first uh, web experimentation uh, this is what drives uh, the evolution of our uh, comparison marketplace and website in recent years, we have developed a proprietary and cutting edge AP, AB testing platform to manage experimentation at scale across tens of categories. The platform applies Bayesian models to analyze the dollar impact of the variation, and it is short in the average experiment length, but more than 25%. We are now building a contextual multi arm bandit platform to enable automatic experimentation capabilities. Uh, what you can see here is a very cool uh, screenshot from our internal uh, 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 testing uh, tool, AB, uh, which is used by product manager, analysts, and business owners. So um, over the years, we have developed a culture of experimentation in the company. We are very data-driven and use stati statistics to drive the value we bring to the consumer. So what you can see uh, in the slide is uh, uh, the intuitive uh, result talking the business language and it allows, it, and it empowers the business uh, user and product managers to own their experiments and to manage them. Second area uh, where we focus uh, is uh, a ranking. Uh, Roy Kani will uh, uh, further dive into this area. So our charts are managed by AI model, which on the one hand personalized experience and on the other end optimized business value for partners. We currently have more than 150 models trained and deployed daily into production. The technology is of course generic and applies few data science uh, techniques in order to support uh, um, real-time ranking across uh, categories. And again, Rui will further explain on the challenges on, and on our solution. Uh, here again, a screenshot, a nice screenshot of uh, AP test in a specific uh, business category, point of sale. So here you can see the man versus the machine uh, test. Obviously, uh, in this example, the machine has won. Uh, but the, for us, uh, we, we utilized, of course, our tools, uh, both to drive uh, features and to drive uh, our experimentation with the models. And lastly, uh, as I said, Asaf and Rui will present Apache Liminal, the ML orchestration platform uh, we developed uh, in and I and contributed to the community. 
I really encourage, uh, encourage all of you to take a look on our repo and the JIRA and maybe consider joining the effort as individual uh, or as companies. And of course, if you want uh, more, uh, more details on the project or how to, to start working with it, you are more than welcome to uh, message me. Uh, so this is the intro. I uh, hope it was uh, interesting. Uh, Asaf, uh, go ahead uh, to present uh, Apache Liminal. Hi, everyone. Um, let me just pull up my uh, slide real quick. All right. Okay. So uh, great to be here. And fortunately, as uh, Lior said, um, due to COVID uh, outbreak, we had to uh, turn this event into a remote one. But on the positive side, we do seem to have a few more members in the audience who wouldn't have otherwise been able to join us. So uh, there's a blessing in that as well. Uh, so uh, just a quick introduction. So my name is uh, Asaf Pinchasi. Um, I've been working in the intersection of uh, data and machine learning and engineering for the past uh, something like 15 years. Um, these days I'm an independent hands-on consultant, but previously I was leading um, big data engineering groups at PayPal and I was leading uh, the R&D of a medical imaging uh, deep learning company called Zebra Medical. Uh, and uh, I'm currently also a PPMC member in uh, Apache Liminal. And uh, uh, right after me, um, we'll be presenting Roy, Roy Kani from uh, Natural Intelligence. He's a data science uh, team lead there and uh, experienced in uh, multiple uh, disciplines of machine learning. So um, the agenda for the liminal talk is, uh, I'll speak about uh, why, why liminal was built and what, what is the premise behind this uh, tool. And uh, Roy will present the implementation and the production deployment of Liminal at Natural Intelligence, enabling, uh, like Lior said, 150 models to be deployed daily into production. So um, start off by uh, you know, showing you a slide that I kind of lifted from uh, Martin Fowler. He's a rather famous uh, software architect involved in multiple uh, disciplines of software architecture, kind of describing the life cycle of building a machine learning uh, algorithm starting from the phase of uh, building your uh, model initially, doing evaluations and experimentations. Once you have the initial uh, model um, premise working, you try and improve it, then productionalizing it in various ways, uh, meaning cleaning up the code and doing a bunch of other stuff. Uh, you might want to do some testing after the um, model has been packaged uh, to make sure that it behaves as you expect and do uh, all sorts of assertions. And then finally, you want to deploy it uh, into production to serve uh, inference results in multiple kind of um, configurations, be it uh, real-time stream or whatever, whatever your deployment platform is. And obviously, you need to also monitor and observe it to make sure that you know, the model is uh, stable, safe, and sound, um, no drifts or any other uh, um, issues occurring in production. And um, to this, I, I would add that we do have another cycle to repeat this process. We do have another cycle, which is you know a small a small matter of data. Uh, so you know from ingesting uh, data from multiple data sources, doing feature engineering at scale, and deploying data pipelines. Of course, they feed into the the whole pipeline. So here there shouldn't be really any um, any kind of uh, anything outrageous, at least for most of you. And and the question remains like. Um, once we need to repeat this process, right? Um, say we need to refresh our model uh, daily, like Lior mentioned that the natural intelligence does, or for any other reason, how do we actually make this a repeatable process, a process that's not ad hoc? Um, and that's really the, the, the question that I'd like to present. So I'll present a couple of challenges that our most teams kind of encounter when they try to make this process repeatable. And the first thing that becomes very obvious is that this machine learning lifecycle is fraught with an incredible number of tools and, and um, steps that need to happen. Um, so, you know, I'll just really quickly show a, a very uh, illustrative diagram. 
So you know you have all these data platforms for ingesting data, for storing data, for querying data, or building features. You have your bunch of uh, uh, frameworks uh, which you use to actually express your code. You might be using feature stores in offline to train your models uh, of various types. Uh, once you are uh, in the phase of experimentation, um, you have a bunch of stuff that you want to look into. You want to look at your TensorBoard while it's running, but you also do experiment tracking and, and store your results uh, of every experiment so that you can a reproduce it and, and b understand what what uh, model approach or hyperparameter configuration actually worked of course you can do hyperparameter tuning automatically here when you productionalize your model you might need to uh, kind of compile it uh, either quantize it or compile it down to onyx or use all sorts of acceleration frameworks of various types and uh, uh, you want to store it somewhere uh, for the testing this is a relatively uh, area where, where there aren't that many tools for actually testing uh, properties of models but they're starting to come up now i can update this uh, slide quite easily with a bunch of tools that are coming up uh, to do with understanding model behavior at scale distributions of um, various types of biases or, or other kind of properties that you want to uh, make sure for the deployment platforms, you have a bunch of different ways to deploy inference models. These are just a few of the um, um, ones that I, I put out there for where, where you actually deploy your models to, for inference, say, in real time. Um, you, you need to have a feature store somewhere in production if you're doing classical machine learning in order to be able to uh, um, compute features on the fly and, and, then, and then use them in inference. And then, obviously, for the monitoring, there are a bunch of different things you want to use so uh, i think it's uh, it's pretty clear that um, we have a bunch of tools and and you know when when people kind of think about this operationalizing this process they often think what is this what what is the next ml ops tool that i'm going to use to kind of solve all my problems and and you know you, you can look at a bunch of different tools to to help you address this, this issue and and the, more more of them are, are just keep coming up so I think a lot of the a lot of the um, uh, dialogue around uh, operationalizing machine learning uh, uh, products has really been focused on the tools. And Liminal is a tool, but I think it's taking a, a, an approach that um, you know might might work better in a in an environment where there's a plethora of, of underlying tools and infrastructure that you need to orchestrate. Um, so that's the the tooling part. But then I think a lot of a lot of People kind of who've been working in this field for a while understand that there's another thing, uh, another difficulty apart from this uh, plethora of tools that you need to manage and this uh, very heterogeneous life, life cycle, which is really the kind of cultural aspect of uh, operationalizing models. Okay, so, um, and, and here we're, we're talking about stuff that's a bit less visible than the, the tooling. Um, but I think when, when teams kind of try to decide how do I operationalize my model, uh, one of the approaches is okay. How do we how do we make sure that somehow data scientists who are not engineers are able to uh, uh, do stuff that that affects production? And one of the approaches that we see in many many cases is handing over research notebooks from from data scientists to engineers. And this is um, by the way, I lifted most of these uh, memes from a guy called Ariel Piller, who is who is uh, uh, notorious for his uh, MLOps memes. So. One approach is handing over notebooks, like have, have a data scientist write a notebook, give it to an engineer, and the engineer will somehow miraculously understand what they meant and operationalize it and turn it into a proper code. Uh, that's one approach. Um, some people um, still use it. Uh, I think it's been kind of shown that this is a, a very big factor of uh, slowing down projects in, in most cases that are not trivial. Another approach is to say, okay, so uh, let the researcher, uh, the data scientist, develop their model and do the initial research and their main building blocks just be that the same platform on which they deploy their production machine learning pipeline, right? The pipeline that needs to run nightly and, and work in a well-orchestrated way and maybe use various different uh, underlying infrastructure. So this is another meme. I'm not sure if it's his. I think maybe it is uh, where, um, you know, you see you see the, the, the try and the approach where, where people try to pull data scientists to use technologies that are quite complex, that are suitable for um, you know, more of a production environment. Um, and that's also an approach that 
doesn't work for all uh, data scientists in my experience. Um, and then there are the, the magical MLOps platform that, uh, that prevent researchers from needing to understand anything about the underlying infrastructure that they're running on, um, that, that enable them to operate independently without any engineers in the picture, but somehow obfuscate all the nitty gritty details of how say Kubernetes works and, and they don't need to understand anything, right? So these are the main kind of, when you think about uh, tooling that's out there, these are the kind of uh, underlying approaches that these tools are trying to take in order to, to kind of bridge the chasm between uh, research and, and engineering. Uh, and you know, here, here I, um, I can show like really quickly, uh, it's not really the topic of the conversation, but really quickly like a selection of uh, four tools uh, that are more in the kind of, um, I would say, you know, that fall somewhere in the spectrum that try to, uh, you know, kind of address this, uh, this challenge of the machine learning uh, orchestration issue uh, by, for example, by um, um, creating one platform that can kind of take care of or is opinionated about almost every step of the machine learning lifecycle, right? From uh, where you do uh, your data processing and data engineering jobs, how you do experiment tracking, even how you do serving, and also how you orchestrate these steps in order to make the, the process repeatable. So uh, the Databricks stack is kind of very Spark-centric and it's opinionated about the kind of tools that you might want to use for each step of the uh, lifecycle. Kubeflow is uh, another very Kubernetes-centered uh, platform that uh, attempts to basically bring uh, into, into the same platform uh, tools that uh, that would fit into its ecosystem that, that will be able to communicate with uh, each step, be it like from the research step of uh, you know where you run your notebooks, all the way to how you do serving and 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 other stuff, including the orchestration. Um, and then obviously there are the cloud providers who provide an end-to-end -end platform. Uh, again, opinionated about the tools, opinionated to some extent about the lifecycle, but tries to. Kind of eliminate some of the challenges of integrating multiple technologies by kind of provi providing uh, researchers with with one stop shop. Um, so these are the kind of uh, you know some of the kind of platforms that, that people have been building, and each of them uh, kind of tries to reduce the uh, uh, variability of tooling and create a holistic experience for data scientists. Um, and uh, I think you know our our kind of approach with liminal is, is really we, we want to address these two main, main aspects, right? So one is the, how do we uh, allow data scientists to kind of bridge the gap um, in terms of tooling, in terms of uh, using a very uh, diverse set of tools within her uh, machine learning process and, and not have uh, tool fatigue. And to this end, um, liminal kind of is not too uh, opinionated about the, the specific tooling that um, data and uh, data scientists choose in order to perform the machine learning task. It's more concerned with the orchestration. How do we move artifacts from one step of the uh, of the development to the next, uh, and how do we uh, make this process uh, into a pipeline? So that's one approach. So we're less opinionated about the tools you use for your data science. And the second one, the second element of uh, how to deal with tool diversity, is really to kind of leverage existing uh, open source initiatives that have been uh, alive and well for, for a long time and have quite a lot of integrations with uh, leading uh, infrastructures at least so that uh, we don't have to. Like we're, we're using a, a good starting point uh, for well-tested uh, orchestration pipe, uh, engines that are able to integrate with a bunch of uh, underlying infrastructure. So this is to address the tool diversity and to address the underlying issue of how do we empower uh, data scientists who are not engineers to do kind of engineering work at the end of the day, uh, our approach is to kind of create a formal language or a contract between the data scientists and the engineers that manage the platforms so that they can have a, a kind of a formal definition of what is this entity, what is this pipeline that they're trying to orchestrate or operationalize so that each of them can contribute uh, their piece to the, to the project while having a clear idea of what they're doing together. Um, so I'll just show a very kind of abstract, but I think maybe a reasonably uh, descriptive uh, explanation of how, what is working with liminal actually mean. 
So let's say we have a pipeline that we want to operationalize and, and it has you know, a bunch of steps for uh, Spark based feature engineering jobs. And then we want to do some training using scikit-learn and doing some model evaluation. And um, then we want to be able to um, also uh, add whatever inference code is needed in order to be able to serve this, uh, this model in production. These are the logical tasks that uh, we're required to do. And so the first step is uh, for a kind of data scientist to go and author essentially a Python, standard Python um, uh, modules for each of these steps. This one can use PySpark. Uh, this one can use scikit-learn um, uh, API. This one can use whatever pandas or whatever. And the serve can also be a kind of a pretty standard uh, um, uh, Python module with, with a bunch of methods that are able to do the inference. Um, so once the data scientists have authored these, and, and again, here, she can choose whatever tooling uh, internally she wants to use. Uh, it could be not psychic, it could be something else. We're less opinionated about that. Uh, what she also provides is a, a YAML file called liminal.yaml. Um, that kind of describes uh, this pipeline or adds a bunch of metadata on top of these modules so that we can kind of create a description of what is this pipeline that she's trying to run. And using a, um, using a liminal CLI, she's able to um, run a command that basically builds uh, out of these modules, builds an airflow uh, based uh, directed at cyclic graph with a bunch of uh, underlying technologies, so if she's using Spark, fine. If she's using Fast API for serving, um, some something that's uh, that, that we get out of the YAML. We basically build a directed acyclic graph uh, in Airflow, and we're able to run it directly on her laptop. So moving from these disparate models, these standard Python models that have a main function, using a YAML file, um, and using the liminal build tool. She's able to deploy a local version of this pipeline running on Airflow uh, with all the underlying technologies and really run it end to end locally. Okay. Uh, a word for those of you who are not aware of Airflow Airflow is a uh, um, basically a directed ethically graph execution engine. It's been around in the open source community for a good number of years, I think originated for Air from Airbnb. It's uh, a very well uh, battle tested in production. It's able to run directed ethically graph jobs uh, on a bunch of different underlying platforms. So once the uh, data scientist <clears throat> has uh, managed to create this uh, liminal YAML file and deploy this pipeline locally, um, now comes the, the part that the engineer is supposed to provide. So the engineer provides essentially uh, another YAML file that is able to kind of define declaratively the underlying infrastructure on, when the, on which this pipeline needs to run in production. So here, while she's working on a local laptop, of course, it's all running locally using Docker Compose or local Kubernetes. But when we run the, this same pipeline in production, the engineer needs to provide a bunch of different things. So where is the Spark cluster on which the feature engineering jobs should run in production? Are we running, are we deploying services on Kubernetes, et cetera, et cetera. So the engineer provides this YAML. And all the uh, data scientist needs to do is to kind of inherit that YAML. She doesn't need to understand all the nitty gritty details of how Kubernetes works, but she does need to kind of uh, obey this template that the, the engineer uh, has created. And then using a CI CD tool, we're able to trigger uh, using a, a liminal, we're able to trigger a kind of a job that builds the environment, kind of a mirror of the environment that the data scientist was using locally, but using the production uh, uh, infrastructure. So. This environment is deployed, say, in a cloud. It has uh, it deploys uh, uh, the, the pipeline as an Airflow DAG into a production Airflow cluster. It uses the production uh, Spark cluster or an EMR, you know, or whatever uh, kind of managed Spark you want to use. It deploys uh, the jobs that do the training on Kubernetes, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So the same description that she's using here, using a, a different kind of uh, inheritance. Uh, the, uh, from a, a template that the engineer provides, is a, uh, we're able to transform that into a fully fledged uh, deployment in a production environment and expose uh, an endpoint for inference, which the client can uh, can then query. 
So the idea is really to summarize, uh, we focus on the orchestration and not the internal tooling of machine learning. We try and uh, build on a well-established uh, platform of Airflow uh, that is able to integrate with many, many underlying infrastructures like Spark and Kubernetes, et cetera, in order to orchestrate the DAGs. And we also give the engineers and the data scientists a language through which they can configure their machine learning system in such a way that the data scientists can run locally and test, but the engineer can really make sure that the environment in production is able to actually uh, run this uh, 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 pipeline on a schedule and deploy it to the four endpoints. So this is really the overall idea behind the uh, um, behind Liminal and the kind of philosophy, the design philosophy. And I think now Roy will show you how uh, natural intelligence is applying this uh, infrastructure locally to, to train and deploy 150 models daily. Um, thank you. Roy? Yes. You want to take over? Yep. Also, can you see my screen? Yes. Cool. Okay, so thank you, Asaf. Uh, I'm Roy, a data science team leader here at uh, Natural Intelligence. And I will talk about how we use uh, Liminal to build and serve our personalized ranking system. So, So what we do here at the Natural Intelligence is to show the top 10 providers in many services and categories. For example, uh, meal delivery, personal loans, home security, insurance, dating, and many more. Uh, the way it works is that users come to our site, search for some category, compare between the different providers. And if they pick some provider, then this provider will pay Natural Intelligence some uh, payout. And now, as you can imagine, in a specific top 10 chart, the different providers differ in some aspects that will lead to change in the performance of the chart. For example, some providers have better brand awareness, while others have cheaper products, and others have a better sales team. In addition, some providers may be a better fit for just a certain portion of the users. Uh, for example, uh, in the dating category, a brand like Tinder may be a better fit for younger users who use mobile devices, but uh, may act poorly for desktop users. Uh, or in uh, the website building category, a brand like Wix, which has a freemium offer, will probably work relative better for users who search for a free website building. So it is quite obvious that different charts uh, sorting can dramatically change the engagement of the users and have a major impact on our income. Uh, my team task was to build a solution that will rank these top 10 charts across all the different categories, taking into consideration the, the user features. So let's start with some challenges for creating a generic ranking uh, solution in a company like Natural Intelligence. So, a big issue is uh, the huge differences that we have uh, between the different categories properties. So for example, the amount of data. Uh, things like the number of visits, clicks, conversions, uh, some of the categories have extremely low volumes while others have very high volumes. So certain machine learning solutions that may work for some categories will probably work poorly for others. Another difference is the conversion payoff. Uh, this payoff can range between a few dollars uh, in, some, uh, in some categories into hundreds of dollars in other categories. Uh, another issue is the fact that we have several conversion types. So some providers may pay us for, for lead, uh, others for sale, and others may even pay us on a revenue uh, share base. And this kind of diversity creates uh, some complexity. In addition, we also have to handle with the variety of conversion feedback delays. So, so the conversion feedback delays, the times that it takes from once the user clicked on our site to the time that we got the response if he 
has converted or not. Uh, so in some con categories like antivirus software, the feedback is very fast. Uh, the user usually buys immediately after clicks. But in categories like mortgage, mortgage loans, uh, where there is still a long process that the user has to go through after the online experience, the delay can range from days to weeks. Uh, a quite a unique uh, challenge that uh, we have uh, is that some providers are limiting us in the number of clicks or conversions that we can send to them. For example, a certain provider can limit the number of conversions that he will be willing to pay on. So for example, uh, 1000 conversions in each month. In this case, even if this provider works better than all others, we will have a problem to rank it first for each of our users because uh, we will violate the budget constraint. Uh, in other cases, uh, we may have the opposite. So we may have some commitment to some providers to send them at least a certain number of sales. So, uh, this is another constraint that uh, we have to handle. Uh, another kind of challenge is the fact that uh, each category uh, may, may have different stakeholders here at Natural Intelligence. So the product, business, content, marketing teams that uh, care about the dating uh, category are not the same ones who care about the loans categories. So of course, each team has uh, different priorities, values, needs, uh, features that they like us to pay attention to. And uh, the second big issue is that there are all kinds of KPI that the stakeholders care about. So they certainly care about the user engagement. They obviously care about the revenue per visit that the chart earns, but they also care about the uh, more subtle KPIs, things like uh, the ratio of leads to sales uh, that we send to some providers, uh, or the amount of certain types of conversions that we send to some other provider. So the problem with this is that we cannot maximize all these KPIs simultaneously uh, because there is a trade-off between them. Uh, we can try to come up with some aggregate measures that uh, will, uh, will aggregate uh, these uh, KPIs, but, uh, but here come the question, uh, what, what weights should we use? Should uh, this weight be uh, different uh, for different categories? Maybe the stakeholders should uh, configure them. Uh, probably, probably this will, will not be a good idea. So the solution that we chose is, uh, well, let's take only one KPI and try to maximize it and uh, treat all the others, uh, other KPIs as constraints in a maximization algorithm to be more specific, a linear programming uh, algorithm. So our task is giving the user feature sort the chart in a way that will maximize the revenue while keeping all the constraints fulfilled. Um, here we can see the, the general uh, linear programming uh, formulation, uh, which you can find in, uh, Wiki, find in Wikipedia. Uh, so in our case, we have a, a vector X, which is uh, uh, has the same length as the number of possible ranking permutation. Okay, so, so each um, each possible permutation, we are going to uh, to use some entry in the x vector uh, in order to represent uh, the probability of showing this uh, permutation to a user. Uh, the c vector is the corresponding revenue estimation of each permutation. Uh, in, in the constraints, the B vector here is the, the maximal value of the constraints. Uh, for instance, the ice value uh, of B can be uh, the maximum uh, monthly budget of some provider. And A is a matrix with all the different estimation for how each permutation consumes each constraint. So this is nice, but uh, the problem is that we need uh, to have a lot of estimation for the C vector and the A matrix. So this is the second part of our solution, uh, which just use uh, classical machine learning uh, pipelines uh, to train uh, for the different KPIs. So we have a model to train for any permutation, what the revenue is going to be. 
or what uh, the budget consumption is going to be or, or quality or things like this. And then we use the, while, train, while running the linear programming algorithm, we use uh, these models to fill all the inputs. Yeah. Here we can see uh, uh, the high-level architecture, arch architecture diagram of our ML solution. There are three parts. One is the lake house, where we can find all the data, including configuration data from the CRMs and CMS, uh, and of course, the performance data that contains all the user features, provider features, the actual rankings that the user saw, and all the actual KPIs uh, for each impression. Uh, the middle the rectangle is uh, our training environment. This environment is fully configured by Liminal and it's where we define our pipelines for the ranking algorithm and train all the various KPI models. So each little, uh, each little rectangle, you represent a different KPI model which you train on a different airflow pipeline. Some of these models are trained in the category level while others are trained on the entire data set. And we usually train these models on a daily or a weekly schedule. The bigger rectangle is the, is the ranking pipeline, the, the linear programming. Uh, this pipeline runs on each hour as we need to react fast to changes in the, in the configuration. And it runs a different task for each category. The third component is the serving component. Uh, this environment is uh, Python based. Again, the Docker uh, artifact is created and managed by Liminal. We use uh, Flask for the web framework, but we're currently moving to fast API as we need to, to provide inferences in under 30 milliseconds. Uh, so, so as you can see, uh, the hard provisioning and the orchestration part are managed by Liminal. So for me and my team, it gives uh, the ability to build and run this kind of pipeline locally or remotely without the need to be familiar with uh, too many infrastructure details. Uh, so now let's see a short example of how the team use Liminal uh, to build this complex workflow. <laughs> so, uh, in the left image, we can see an example of how uh, an airflow pipeline of one of our KPI models. Um, so we have some preliminary task, which is shared uh, across all the category. And then we parallelize the training. So each category gets its own uh, model. And in the end, we uh, consolidate all these models into one uh, uh, API and uh, push it to the model, uh, model store to be consumed in serving. Uh, so in the left uh, image, we, in, so, sorry, in the, the right image, we can see how, how we can build this kind of uh, pipeline using uh, the liminal YAML. So uh, we can see in the top uh, that we define the, the, the pipeline, the airflow pipeline, and we can also define the schedule and things like this. And then we have the task uh, section. So here we define uh, th this task. So the first task is the Python, Python task based on Kubernetes. Uh, it's actually prepare all the configuration. So it tell us on which uh, categories we should run. Um, then you have some splits and then we create the training itself. So again, it's Python task. We have some C CMD and some uh, image that it used. And um, basically that's it. Um, uh, so another cool uh, feature is the Spark task. Uh, so here we can see is that uh, we can write uh, a SQL in the YAML file uh, and Liminal will set up an EMR, run the SQL on a Spark, and after it finished, it will tear down the, the EMR. So if we think about it, uh, this kind of pipeline, most of, in this kind of pipeline, most of the heavy work can be done in this Spark job that runs as part of the pipeline or maybe in a different pipeline and create all the process data for the category in a, and, and put it in a category partition. So each one of these train tasks can just read the, its parquet file. 
Uh, another nice feature is the monitoring utility, which allow us to add the uh, monitoring to CloudWatch uh, in a declarative manner. Um, and that's it. Cool, thank you, Roy. Uh, thank you very much for the talk. Uh, Roy and the staff. Um, so uh, next uh, on um, is uh, Mike uh, Erlikson on the history of transformers. Yeah. Hello. Oh. Let me share my screen. I, I think I can share share screen. I Just a second. Do you see my slides? Hello? Yes, we do. Yes, okay. we're doing. Okay, cool. So, uh, hello guys, my name is uh, Mike Erickson. I'm working as a principal data scientist uh, in uh, Salt Security. But today I'm not going to talk about what I'm doing in Salt. I'm going to talk about uh, transformers. Uh, I like transformers, so I just wanted to, to tell you what happens uh, on, on this uh, cool deep learning uh, neural net architecture since uh, 2000, uh, 2017, when it was invented uh, by the Google researchers. And uh, my talk will, be, will, will focus on the most exciting research directions on the transformer. And uh, this research was aimed to improve uh, the transformer performance from various uh, perspectives. So, as you as you may as you may know, uh, over the last four years, hundreds, uh, maybe it reached uh, even one thousand uh, uh, papers were handed written on uh, the transformer architecture. Uh, so, I, I have only thirty minutes talk, so I cannot cover all. Uh, all, uh, all the perf all, all, all uh, research directions which have been uh, uh, investigated by the researchers on the transformers. So I will give a brief summary of the most uh, significant ones in uh, from uh, my point of view. And uh, I have a, a full version of this presentation. I will present you on one of the next uh, meetups, so you can uh, follow me on LinkedIn. I will announce about it. And. Uh, uh, this presentation is based on uh, two server pay papers, but mostly it was based by uh, survey on transformers pay paper by, by Lynn et al. Okay, so uh, let's start on the agenda. Uh, first, I'll start uh, from a quick recap on uh, transformers. When I I'll talk about uh, the transformer usages, about domains and tasks and architectures and configurations. When I will uh, discuss what are the main uh, transformer uh, flaws and shortcomings and what can be actually improving, uh, improving the transformers and what was improved in the transformers in the uh, past uh, four and a half years. Uh, so then, uh, then, we discuss, uh, then we discuss the, as you, as you may know, the core component of the transformer is attention. And there are some uh, very interesting researchers which uh, propose transformers uh, without attention. And we discuss, does it work? And if it work, how it work? And uh, in, 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 uh, in, at the end, they will discuss the future of uh, transformers, which means the future research direct, uh, directions, what can be improved uh, in, the, uh, in the transformers from uh, 2022. Okay, let's get started. Okay, uh, the transformer uh, now it, it can be declared as, uh, as you see in the title of this slide, as a new emperor of the NLP world, but not just NLP. The transformers are widely used over the over uh, different domains and in, in uh, for in natural language domain, and it, uh, they are used. They are also wide, very widely used in in, in vision and the many many other domains, audio and video, and you can hardly imagine. A machine learning uh, do, uh, domain which uh, is not using uh, transformers. I think uh, 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 the transformers was uh, used on uh, also for biology. So th it is uh, this architecture is really really very popular. 
So a bit of history, the transformers or the transformer architecture were proposed by Google uh, researchers uh, uh, in 2017. And uh, since, since, since then, almost all NLP models uh, are based uh, on the transformer or BERT. It, uh, it, also, it, it also has BERT and transformers and their names. There are Berta, Albert, Linformer, Reformer, Performer, and many, many others. And in the last uh, two years, transformers also started to conquer the uh, computer vision domain and the other domains uh, such as uh, biology, some uh, very recent uh, uh, developments of uh, Google research team about uh, proteins. So transformers are, re are really very popular. So let's discuss uh, what, what are transformers. Actually, transformers uh, were, uh, were proposed by Google researchers for uh, machine translation initially. So the transformer, you just you just put your input text in, in, in and, the, and then the transformer just uh, translated. So the input is the input and, and the translation is the output. And uh, this transformer this, this transformer is uh, made of uh, encoders and uh, decoders. While which encoder and decoder, and this is very important, encoder encoder is, is made of two main blocks. Uh, the first block is uh, self-attention, and the second block is a standard straightforward neural net. And the decoder is uh, is built from three blocks. The first block is uh, self-attention. The second one is uh, encoder decoder attention, and the and and the last one is a standard straightforward uh, fully connected block. And uh, here here you can see that each that the encoder contains. Multi-head attention, it contains normalization, then uh, it, it uh, follows the uh, fit for a neural net, and then uh, one more normalization layer. But uh, uh, what, 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 what transformer is doing? So uh, you may ask. And uh, the input to a transformer is uh, just a vector representation of, of input sequence. The, uh, so it can be text, it can be image, it can be audio or video. And the uh, and the uh, you, you know you know what is uh, fit for a neural net it's just fully connected layer but what is an intention what what is attention now that we are going to talk about self attention okay what is the attention attention uh, is a method of uh, building sequence element representation based on the similarity you, you can call it connection or relationship with other uh, sequence uh, elements. Uh, namely, we are just building a representation of every sequence element based on other, uh, based on other element of the sequence. So we can call it the uh, contextual, con contextualized embeddings. The, tra the vanilla transformer uh, employs intention me mechanism. We are converting an input representation into two in, into three vectors. The first vector is called the uh, query. The second one is called key. And the third one uh, is called volume. And, and then uh, we compute the normalized uh, attention weights as a softmax of the uh, key and the value vectors uh, dot product. And then at the last stage of the transformer, all the sequence elements are summed to the attention weights. And here in, in the next slide, you can see how the attention works. So here, the attention weight are just softmax of the dot product of uh, scale uh, keys and uh, and uh, queries, and the, and the attention output is a, is a just a multiplication of attention weights by the scaled version of the in input x. X is a just input sequence representation. For example, if you if your input is a text, which which is a actually a sequence of words. The uh, each each token each token can be represented as a vector and, and this is your input. So if, if if your input is a text, so the your your sequence is represented by by a list of uh, each token representation. Okay, the interesting observation that the, that the transformer can be that the intention can be seen as general as a generalization of feed forward layer. But it is feed for a layer 
with the input dependent weights so we compute the weights of uh, input based on the values of the input itself okay so here you can see very cute picture how how we build the representation of the sentence uh, this is attention here we compute the attention between uh, this and this here we compute the attention when, when the word this and the, the second the token is and here is the attention between uh, this and the word attention and and, and then after aggregating, they get the attention weights for uh, the word with. Okay, so as I already said, uh, transformer is uh, really widely used in uh, many domains. There are three main usage uh, regimes of the trans of the transformers. So the first one, uh, uh, transform. Uh, what uh, so so transformer. Uh, does not make any assumptions about the data structure. Okay, so as opposed to convolutional neural nets and uh, RNNs, which uh, which rely on some assumption of a strong local connection, transformer does not make any assumptions about uh, about uh, data structures. So, the, uh, the 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 main advantage of of uh, this approach is that this. Uh, architecture is capable of comp comp uh, capturing dependencies of different range. But this comes with a very, uh, very significant flaw that it is prone to other fitting when your training data is limited. So, and what, 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 what can we do about it? So, if, if it, so one, uh, as, as I already said, uh, one of the main flaws it, it is a uh, uh, prone to other, other fitting when your training data is limited. So the very uh, very common way of use uh, transformers is uh, pre you, pre you, you pre train your transformers of a very large data set, different self-supervised objectives, for example, predicting the next word uh, given as concept. And then you, you, ju you just clone a very good representation for the, uh, for the downstream task. And the, the, the last stage is just fine tuning your model on your small data set, which can uh, decrease the, the overfitting potential. And you, you, don't, you don't train your large transformer models from scratch usually. Okay. There are two, there are two main usage regimes of transformer. The first one is uh, using of encoder only. As I already said, the uh, transformer uh, is uh, made of three main, uh, two main blocks, which are encoder and uh, decoder. The encoder intention is the building uh, of uh, input representation, and the decoder representation is just using uh, this uh, input representation uh, to, to 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 build the output representation to build to build the output. So if you use uh, uh, only the tra transformer decoder, uh, you can use it as a back uh, as a backbone architecture for many uh, natural language and uh, understanding ta tasks as a sentiment analysis, as a relationship extraction, and uh, topic modeling. The second usage regime is using uh, decoder only. Uh, the, the decoder is trained on language model and, uh, modeling tasks, for example. Uh, uh, for text generation, uh, generation, very popular GPT models, GPT and GPT-2 and GPT-3 models are based only on the decoder. So you're, 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 just, uh, you're just generating uh, your, uh, your output based on the decoder only. And you can also use the decoder uh, together in the encoder as an overall architecture. For example, this, this architecture is uh, Excel's in tasks like uh, question answering and uh, summarization, as an example of of, uh, of these uh, user reg regimes, you can uh, you can see Bart and T5 and uh, and uh, many others. Okay, so now I already told that uh, that the transformers are everywhere and they are very very widely used for uh, many domains. Uh, let's uh, let's be a bit more specific. For NLP, they are used for machine translation and language modeling, and for NER, question, uh, question answering, answering and uh, summarization. For computer vision, they are using for a very diverse tasks as the image classification and object detection, and image, image generation, segmentation, and video processing. 
We are also using audio processing and uh, multi multimodal applications uh, like the visual question answering, speech to text translation, and many, many others. And uh, I already mentioned that they are using uh, genetics, genetics and biology. So, it, so the transforming, uh, transforming usages are not limited to, this, uh, to these domains. Okay, so what are the main problems of the transformers? The main problem of the transformer, uh, one main uh, very, uh, very problematic, uh, uh, very, very problematic property of the transformer is the quadratic complexity. It's, it's quadratic complexity in, the, in terms of the input length. And it is especially uh, it is it, it is especially bad for image and the uh, video application. The, the the length of the input is very large. Now, by by the way, now the uh, visual transformers are just splitting uh, an image to patches. And uh, if you if you split your image for sufficiently large uh, patches, then you don't have too many patches, and uh, you don't have this quadratic complexity problem. But still, the problem exists. You want you want you want you still want to work in uh, in uh, finer resolution in finer resolution. So, as I already mentioned, a transformer does not have any induction bias or, or, or structural prior. As opposed to uh, convolutional neural nets, it does not assume any local uh, dependencies. For example, as uh, between uh, neighboring pixels. And as I already mentioned, in, it may overfit if your uh, data set is small or, uh, or medium size. And uh, as, as for positional, uh, positional encoding, I, 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 I did not mention what is positional encoding. We, we, we use positional in, in encoding to encode each token position in the text. There are very there are specially constructed me, me, uh, method using uh, sine and uh, cosine ways to encode uh, all uh, uh, tokens uh, uh, tokens position in the in the input and uh, the problem that the vanilla transformer uses uh, uses not so efficient uh, encoding scheme and it can be proved improved uh, as well oh sorry uh, and uh, so as i as already mentioned but but the main problem of the transformer is the uh, uh, two formers quadratic complexity in the terms of input length and no induction bias. Okay, so uh, transformers research, uh, research taxon uh, taxonomy. The transformers research was focused in four main direction. The first direction is an problem, uh, improvement of the attention mechanism as it, uh, itself. How can they improve attention or make it less uh, Painful, painful in terms of the input length. The second direction, the second research direction, tried to improve the representativeness of the position encoding. So just uh, trying to build better position encoding, with, with, which encoding all the information of uh, the token uh, of the token position in the text more efficiently. The third direction is enhancement of uh, fully connected uh, feed forward uh, layers. And the large and the and, and, and the large direction is focused on the improvement on the normalization mechanism. I think I mentioned it. Uh, there is a, a layer norm, uh, layer norm in the middle here, and uh, add of no and add and the norm in the transformers. And there are several wo uh, works which try to improve uh, to to replace it by more efficient schemes. Okay, so. Let's talk about attention scheme uh, modification. There are several types of attention scheme modification. The first type is a sparse attention. So we just introduce sparsity bi bias into attention mechanism, leading to reduced complexity. What is sparsity bias? We just compute less attention. We, do, we, we does not compute attention between all, all pairs of tokens, but only with specific uh, pair of tokens. There are linear hesitation, which just uh, tries to linearly approximate the uh, softmax as the attention is computed as a softmax uh, by the token representation. We, uh, there are some works which try to linearly approximate it, and, the, and then the, the attention is computed in, in, the, in the reverse order, and the complexity in this case is linear. The third direction is the prototype and memory uh, compression is just reduces uh, the, the the total number of uh, queries and key value memory pairs 
to reduce uh, attention ma uh, matrix dimension. The three most schemes are uh, low rank uh, self attention. There are, there are many, there are some works which noticed that the self attention uh, matrix, is, mat mat matrix is low rank and it uh, can be leveraged uh, can be leveraged to decrease the computational complexity of uh, of the transformer there is the, the attention the prior it considers the integration of uh, prior attention distribution so uh, so what does it mean it it, it actually it actually mean meaning incorporating some uh, locality uh, constraints into the intention for, for example we can uh, uh, in, 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 the, in, the, in, in your picture for, for, vision, for vision transformers, the, the nearby uh, patches are uh, more uh, connected than the uh, patches which are in the, uh, which are located in the far, uh, very far in the picture. So we can use uh, such locality consideration and, in, uh, and build more effective uh, attention uh, mechanism. And uh, I haven't mentioned it, but the transformers has uh, uh, many head. It's made of many encoder uh, decoder uh, encoder decoder blocks, and the, each each one of these uh, encoder decoder blocks is called uh, attention head. And there are several works, works who try to improve th this uh, multi head uh, mechanism. Okay, now let's talk. Uh, let's discuss. Uh, uh, sparse attention variants and atomic patterns. So the first variant is a, is a, is a global node. So it's which, uh, which hubs for, for uh, information propagation uh, uh, between tokens. The second one is a, is a sliding window. So in the sliding, in the sliding window, we, we, we just compute the attention between uh, uh, query and keys only for the neighbor elements of the sequence okay and uh, this way uh, for, uh, and uh, it is uh, very efficient for data types with uh, inherent locality dependencies such as uh, images or, or or videos or audios the third approach is uh, delayed the uh, strided attention it is similar uh, in, in principle in, uh, to the strided convolution, and it can increase the receptive field of the uh, of the attention. So, for, uh, for, for, for example, you can uh, you can imagine that you compute uh, the attention only between uh, uh, tokens who are uh, distanced uh, by even distance and not by all the distance. So you uh, and this way you decrease the number of uh, computation by by a factor of two. One more way is a, a random attention. So you just compute a, a attention the, the randomly chosen tokens. Some, surprisingly, there are at least uh, two works, uh, works which prove that it, uh, which uh, this approach can work and uh, improve the tra transform performance. And the and the last one is a block local attention. You just split your input sequence into several non overlapping uh, query blocks and uh, each query uh, is uh, is related to the attention of each query is computed only for the keys in the corresponding cluster so uh, so this way uh, all 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 these types of attention are designated to uh, to decrease the quadratic complexity of the attention computation in terms of the input length Okay, here I can see some pictures of you of uh, of uh, some atomic patterns, which is uh, this is a global hub. You can see you are just uh, you you are, you are, you are just summarizing all the attention of these blocks into two vectors, which you which you can see here in the brown, which is a band attention. You compute attention only for tokens who, uh, which are near in the in the sequence. Here it is deleted. Here you, can, you, you just compute the attention between tokens in the in, in the random position. And here, with, uh, this is a block, so you, you you compute for 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 this token. You compute attention only between tokens which are in this block. Okay, and uh, there are many variants uh, with sparse attention uh, with the multiple atomic patterns. Uh, you just combine the above uh, mentioned patterns 
you can, uh, and this is used in star transformers and the uh, long former NTC. And in Big Bird, what, you, what, what, what do you do? You just combine several atomic patterns. Okay. More attention variants, this var variance which was used by BPT, which is a type of uh, hierarchical attention. So you compute uh, your attention between uh, tokens which are, uh, which are located near, near in your uh, sequence. And then you aggregate in this manner to the end, uh, to the root node uh, of this graph. There are some types of, 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 uh, of uh, sparse attention variants like, like block local and actual. And uh, and uh, very and and uh, very interesting uh, uh, type of the attention you can you can compute attention only between uh, uh, tokens which have uh, which uh, which have uh, high similarity. So you don't you don't just compute your attention uh, uh, for all uh, pairs of tokens. You only do it for the tokens which have uh, high similarity scores. Okay, In linear as it, attention. As I already said, the main problem of the transformer is the input, there is a computational complexity, a quadratic computational complexity in terms of the sequence length. So here in the mathematic, in mathematical terms, you just decompose the softmax of uh, the, the multiply, uh, multiply of Q and K by some uh, multiplication of two matrices. And then you just compute the K by uh, the multiplication K by W, and then you just compute it by Q. So mathematics, uh, ma mathematically, it looks uh, this way. So you, so you just compute the multiplication of uh, keys and values before you compute the, comp uh, before you multiply it by uh, queries and which one, uh, uh, and, 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 uh, and uh, uh, this operation just uh, enables you to, uh, uh, to perform self-attention computation in, uh, in linear complexity in terms uh, of uh, input length. And there are some papers who just, uh, who did the similar uh, things. And the, the problem is, as you can understand, how, how do you approximate this uh, softmax, this attention score by some uh, linear functions? You need, you need some special structures of your, uh, of your uh, uh, attention scores computation. Uh, uh, so uh, the, uh, there are some papers who tried to uh, replace softmax uh, by, by other functions. So it is very interesting uh, research direction. Uh, the, the next uh, research direction is a query prototyping and uh, memory compression. Uh, what do you hear? Just reduce the attention complexity by reducing the number of uh, 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 queries or k, k, k values pairs, and there are uh, many ways to do it. You can just uh, compute uh, yeah, you, uh, the first way: just compute attention vectors with several prototypes. You you you, you have the uh, kind of code book on uh, on queries, and then you compute the attention vectors using only this. Uh, the uh, query vectors from uh, this notebook. And a uh, very interesting type of uh, query prototyping is uh, cluster detention. Then you group your queries into several clusters, and then you, comp you compute it, your attention vectors only for your cluster centroids. And all cluster queries share the attention vector of, uh, of their centroid. Now, low, uh, low rank self attention, and it's very interesting research direction, direction as well. There are some works who, uh, who, who noticed that the soft, soft max, soft, uh, that the attention weights matrix is a low rank and it can be modeled by low rank uh, parameterization or replaced by low rank uh, approximation. As, uh, as you can see here, what is low rank? It's the matrix which, which has uh, very similar uh, rows or columns. Okay, I'll skip this one because I don't have time. The attention, attention, attention is prior. Here, as I already, as, as I already explained, uh, transformer does not uh, assume any relationships, any structural bias, to, or or any prior. And this prior can uh, can be added to the attention computation. For example, 
you can uh, you, you can you can you you you, uh, you can try to force the attention mechanism to give higher scores for uh, for tokens who are close uh, in the in the in, in the input sequence and then you, you can just uh, you, you can just combine your prior attention with the intention which you compute in uh, in a regular way okay I will skip on uh, this one and a very interesting uh, direction as well is a multi-head attention as I already told uh, each head is a encoder decoder pair and that captures different contextual in inputs by mixing tokens and uh, why it is done it is done uh, to, to expand the model's uh, ability to, fo to focus on different position so uh, in other words it gives the attention layer multiple representation uh, uh, subspaces in terms of architecture it's just multiple sets of query keys and, and v matrices and each uh, each such triple is used to project the token embeddings into different uh, representation uh, subspaces what is the problem here? There's no guarantee that different heads indeed capture uh, distinct uh, features. And then uh, there are some words we try, uh, we try to force this uh, attention, attention heads to represent different uh, features of the input. I, I don't have, I don't, I don't have uh, uh, too much time. So uh, there are some mechanisms uh, who, who can guide different attention heads behavior so so the, the problem is that uh, every head we want we want every head to do different things so they can they, they can uh, try to impose uh, to impose differences between uh, q k and uh, the uh, the matrices okay i have many slides so i will I, I will think i will go to the end of my presentation i have i have 10 minutes okay Lior, do i have 10 minutes or no um, I think uh, around uh, six to ten. <laughs> okay, okay. So let's talk a bit about uh, uh, sequence position representation or positional encodings. We are just uh, as, as I already told uh, that positional 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 encoding is just is is a way to represent each token position uh, in the sequence. It is not embedded in is encodings. And then uh, one of the approaches to do it, the vanilla transformer just uh, build the token representation. We are we are fixed uh, sine and cosine uh, functions, and there are some works which propose the learnable positional encodings. Uh, so which we just we just learn uh, a positional encoding or in encodings to a specific task task through uh, backpropagation. The, the, uh, there are some problems with uh, this, uh, this uh, approach, and the most important one is that this approach is not able to handle sequences longer than the sequences seen in the training time. And uh, additional, uh, additional uh, very cool approach is uh, to use the relative positional presentation, which are uh, encode the token uh, uh, token representation wire positional uh, pairwise positional relationships between uh, uh, did, uh, input elements for example uh, direction or distance and this approach can be better than the approach of learnable uh, positional encodings so i will go to the end of the presentation uh, many cool stuff i don't have time to cover sorry okay so as i already explained the main the core block of the transformer is the, is, is the attention block and now the question is can we achieve the performance of transformers or at least the close uh, close and the close performance without the intention and uh, the, the actually the answer to the question is uh, yes we can achieve uh, that you can achieve performance which is very close to the performance of the, of the transformers uh, without using uh, attention mechanisms, which I already mentioned uh, many times, it's a very, uh, very serious problem of uh, quadratic complexity in the terms of uh, input uh, input length. Okay, and there are three uh, very interesting works in uh, in uh, this direction, and uh, as I already called, uh, we are going to discuss a bit in the in the last uh, three minutes. We are going to discuss an attention replacement. 
the first walk is uh, all, all this, by the way, all this works are from the last year. Okay, the first walk is called the uh, NLP mixture. And here is the tension is reply is replaced by token mixing uh, uh, multi layer perceptron and channel, channel mixing. And each one is made up of two fully connected layers and uh, some uh, nonlinearity. So for, 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 as you can see in this hand, it is, it is uh, very simple. They are just mixing the, the channel dimension and then uh, they are mixing uh, the token dimension. And if you are do it uh, enough times, you can reach performance, which is very, very close to the performance of the vanilla transformer. And I think uh, this this uh, the, uh, this attention to replacement was done for uh, visual transformers, uh, which which are good, which are uh, built for uh, image for the, the image for, for the image domain. But I think it can work on, uh, also in other domains as, as well. Uh, the second replacement of the transformer is uh, also very cool. It is called F uh, Fnet. And it was also, it was also, I, I think it, it, it is the paper of the last year. And here it, the attention is replaced by very simple token mixing mechanism. We are just mixing similarly to, to, the, to, the, to the previous attention replacing mechanism. We are, we, are replacing, we, are, we are replacing it by two mixings. The first mixing is other sequence dimension. And the and the and the second mixing is order of embedding dimension, and then the mixing is done by two discrete Fourier transforms order two dimension. So it is very very simple. You just do two Fourier transforms. Okay, so you can see in this hem, Bimco, uh, it's instead instead of uh, uh, instead of uh, vanilla self attention computation, you are using this. Two consequent Fourier transforms to, and uh, this work also uh, was proven to to achieve nearly uh, perform nearly uh, 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 transformers uh, performance in uh, several tasks. The fourth uh, the transformers replacement is uh, very interesting. It is called XIT. I think it is also. Uh, 2021 paper. Uh, this, it is called cross co cross covariance uh, image transformers. As you can uh, as you can see, which is uh, also vision transformers. And here the translation is uh, is is replaced by trans uh, transpose self attention. The transpose uh, transpose self attention. As I already told you, uh, an attention works other uh, the token domain. And uh, this is this is the main reason that the that, that, uh, uh, computational complexity to the transformer is uh, quadratic in terms of uh, segments length. But here, they, uh, they, they just, uh, they, they just uh, put it in, uh, they just do it in other way, in the, in the transposed way. They just uh, build the tension, which operates, I'm finishing to mean, which operates over uh, channels and not other tokens. So now we build a tension, which are built over, over the embedding dimension, okay? It is uh, also very, very simple. You just, instead of doing transpose in the vanilla transformer self-attention computation, you just, you, 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 you just don't, don't do it. And then your complexity is, is, uh, is uh, linear in, in the number of tokens in the sequence, but it is uh, quadratic in the, embedding of, uh, in the embedding dimension of your tokens. Okay, now let's talk about uh, Future the future uh, research directions of the transformer. Uh, uh, still, uh, uh, despite of uh, transformer was was invented in uh, five years, almost five years ago, we don't have a very good theoretical analysis of the transformer's uh, capabilities. They are empirically shown to have larger capacity than uh, CNNs and RNNs, and the default choice for almost. Uh, uh, language, uh, natural language uh, domain tasks, but why this happens? Uh, no, nobody, nobody. It, it was there. There are many intuitive uh, explanation, but there is not a theoretical uh, proof. And the intuitive explanation translate uh, transformer makes no assumption on the data structure. Doesn't have any prior, and that's why it is uh, more flexible. But you know that it is it is it is not theoretical explanation. 
and the last direct and and the and the sorry and the, the second visual uh, research direction is a better global interaction mechanism between uh, attention. So many studies uh, studies show that the full attention is unnecessary for the most tokens. And uh, you don't need to compute attention between all tokens. But if you don't compute the attention between all tokens, how do you model your global interaction efficiently? There are two main ways to do it. Uh, first way is, as a self uh, self attention is a fully connected block with dynamic weights so aggregating non local information with dynamic routing but perhaps there are more advanced and more efficient dynamic routing mechanism and then the second way the global interaction in interaction can, can be also modeled by other uh, neural uh, network types such as uh, memory enhanced models okay and uh, more or less. So it is the last slide. I'd like to thank you for your attention. If you have question, you can ask me where my LinkedIn. So in the if you like transformers, so we can, we, we can discuss it. And the, I think uh, the, the, the transformers domain will have a very interesting uh, research research paper. For many years, we do have many problems to be solved, so stay tuned. Thank you very much. Sorry for being late for uh, 12 minutes. Excellent. Thank you, Mike, very much for the interesting talk. Uh, and lastly, uh, Doron uh, Bartov uh, for the last session. Go ahead. Cool. Uh, let me just share my screen. Sorry to disrupt the transformers uh, uh, pick. Nice pick. So, can you see my screen now? Yes, we can. Okay, great. So, uh, first of all, thanks for the previous speakers. Um, I think actually it's a cool uh, variety of uh, topics we had here today because the first talk was uh, mainly engineering. The second one was mostly a uh, math and th theory of data science. And I'm gonna touch more about like the business uh, domain aspect of, uh, of the modeling. So it's uh, really like touches all of the three domains of uh, data science. So that's nice. Uh, so I'm the one, uh, I'm the head of data science at Autofleet, which is a four year old startup. It works in the uh, mobility space. And I'm here to talk about how machine learning can help you get rid of your car. Uh, before I uh, dive into the talk, uh, I'll just uh, explain why did I choose uh, this uh, clickbait of a title. So getting rid of your car uh, actually is something I think which is uh, pretty noble because uh, the private car today is very lowly utilized. It's uh, being used for about three to 5% of the time that uh, the private car that you have. And also when you do use it, it's mostly uh, being used while you only the only person sitting in there. So it's uh, a lot of ways. And uh, today I want to talk about how we at Autofit uh, are doing uh, our effort in order to propagate this. So Autofleet's mission is to enable the transformation of asset heavy fleets to vehicle as a service providers. And uh, why do we do that? We do that because we see that this is happening. This is uh, some, a disruption in the mobility space that's already happening. People are uh, starting to actually buy uh, less cars, move from the private cars uh, to using uh, demand uh, cars as a service, flexible service that you can actually uh, rent cars uh, in a flexible way or other uh, ways of mobility. Uh, and this makes sense because as I said, the private car is uh, usually uh, wasteful both from the economical standpoint uh, where you buy some kind of a product that you hardly uh, use in terms of time. And also it takes a lot of space and it pollutes a lot. So from uh, the looking at the greener world, I think it's a noble cause. So that's our mission. And uh, we do that using uh, three main products. Uh, the first one is a simulator that helps, uh, we can help co companies 
to understand what are the main KPIs they need in order to deploy new businesses. So we can help businesses to understand uh, fleets, actually. We can help them to understand what are the main KPIs they need to, to have. So what would be the fleet size if they want to enter a new territory? Uh, and uh, in the example of uh, electrical vehicles, for example, we can help them to understand how many chargers they need to put out in the territory and where do they need to put it. So that's the simulation services that we have. And we help businesses also to optimize uh, their existing business models. And uh, this we do uh, through many uh, products. I'm going to touch uh, one, of, uh, uh, one use case of how we do that in this talk deeply. So uh, I'll explain what does that mean. Uh, and the third item is uh, providing right as a service where we can help fleets to offer transportations uh, using planning services. Uh, so uh, fleets can offer uh, transportation for uh, both goods So these are the three main products. We provide that using a full automated platform that uh, has a, a full suite of, uh, of products. So we also have the optimization engine, uh, which is the advanced machine learning stuff and algorithms um, for many products. But we also provide the full suite of uh, enabling a driver app for the fleet operators to actually get the instructions of what they need to do in order to optimize the fleet. We also provide a control center which helps the fleet owners to understand the current state of the fleet and getting live data. And we, also, we do that using a fully automated integrated integration hub where uh, the fleets can push and pull data uh, using a flexible API. So today I'm going to talk about a specific use case that we do in Autofleet that will help you guys understand what does data science have to do with all of this. Um, and I'm going to talk about a specific use case in the car sharing uh, space. So what is car sharing? I think uh, probably all of you know uh, this type of product. It's a product where like Autotel uh, enables and gives in Tel Aviv that you can rent a car or any other vehicle for that matter uh, from one point and you can rent it and you can return it at a different point. So this is a, actually a great uh, business model. I personally love it and I use a lot of uh, these services but it creates a challenge from the operational uh, point of view. So it creates a challenge of, uh, of uh, rebalancing, meaning that uh, cars may end up uh, in areas where there is low demand. And this is called uh, the rebalancing problem. So in most cases, the demand trip profile is asymmetric, meaning that people tend to rent cars from specific locations, which are high, high demand, marked in dark red, as we can see in this uh, map, and they can return it and they can actually move them to areas where there is low demand. So this will cause a situation where the many cars are in pockets of low demand and they will not be utilized. So we want to help fleet uh, owners to address this problem. So what we want to do, sorry, what we want to do, we want to help them to understand how should they move the cars, which cars should they move and how to which areas. And this is an important feature because uh, as you might have guessed, and as we see from the data, we see that the conversion rate, meaning that people who open their app looking for a car tend to rent the car less if the distance to the car is very far. So if the distance is small, as we can see in this example, taken from one of our, uh, one of our uh, uh, customers. So if the distance to the car is small, then the chances to actually rent a car is much higher than if it's far away. So in this example, we see that the conversion rate, meaning a booking of a ride from the session, from the app session is 30% if the distance is low and it's about less than 5% if the distance is high. So this tells us again, that we want to make the cars much more available where the demand area is. So this is a motivation for us in order to actually move those cars much closer to where we predict there's going to be high demand. So in order to solve the rebalancing problem, we scope it like so. We're going to build a demand prediction model. And then after we'll have a prediction of where the demand is high, then we'll be able to uh, compare 
what is the current state of the fleet? Where are the cars right now? And we have that because we have all of the location of the cars at the moment because we use the, they use the API. And we have the prediction, meaning that we know what the theoretical demand, where is it going to be high? So we can compare between the actual state and the desired state, and then we can actually give out tasks, allocate the tasks in order to optimize the fleet uh, location, to optimize the location of the cars within the fleet, and then create the maximum utilization for that fleet. So that's how we scope the problem. But let me ask you this, what should we consider demand? Like we want to predict where the demand is going to be high. So what is the demand? What do we actually want to predict? What's the target? Can anybody take a guess? Well, I guess I, know it's I, hard guess, with the I guess you need to start with uh, with idea of uh, people using app and searching for for vehicles. Um, okay, so why why would you say app? That that's a good answer. That's actually a really good answer. Well, why I, would you say an app and not actually the ride itself? Uh, well, because uh, you are talking about the demand, not about rides, right? So mm -hmm. people might want, as you showed the, the plot, right? People might want to or might be interested in taking a ride, but the car is far away, so they just quit, right? They resign. Yeah, yeah. So, so generally, you probably can compute demand as a function of, of, um, of searches in the app, right? Yeah, well, cool. So that's a really good answer. I might have given like a big tip in order to, to you actually dodged my uh, my question here because that like a uh, ride was supposed to be like the obvious obvious answer, uh, but you're totally right. Rides, the actual rides that uh, this is what we actually want is a biased estimator, and it's biased because uh, bookings or rides is biased by the supply. So if there was no supply of cars or any other vehicle. Uh, depending on the business model in the area, it means that this uh, this KPI is going to be biased, and that that is why we use the app sessions uh, uh, as an indication of the hidden demand of the actual demand. It's an assumption we make. In most cases, it works pretty well. So, getting back to the initial scope that I uh, drew back then, then we added another block. Now we're going to uh, change it a bit and add another model. So we're going to predict the sessions, how many sessions and where and when the session uh, uh, are going to be high. And then we're going to convert that to rides. So given the sessions, we're going to predict how many rides are going to uh, happen. And then we're going to apply the matching algorithm, the assignment algorithm in order to give out, uh, to, to rebalance the fleet according to the predicted demand. Great. So let's uh, touch each of those uh, models separately, starting from the start. So the first model is the session prediction model. Uh, and in here, this plot shows uh, one example of uh, sessions from one of our territories uh, of the total uh, number of app sessions uh, as a function of time. Uh, and this signal, as you uh, probably guess, is uh, dependent both on time and both in geog on the geography. So sessions are uh, they're showing different behavior during weekends and holidays. There's also a trend component in many cases. So obviously, it's the time series signal. And in addition, uh, it also obviously depends on uh, geog the geography. So uh, this is a, a signal that's both dependent on, on both of these features. And that is why uh, the two main families of features are going to be like so. So the first family of features that we'll use, and this is obviously, this depends on the model we'll choose. Uh, I'm gonna talk about this soon, uh, but the way we encoded the features uh, in this uh, model is we use weekdays and hour of day, trends and leg features. We also use holidays uh, from the geography uh, features. We use location and the neighborhood distance from the city center, distance from main attractions, universities in many examples is a prominent feature. And other features as well that we might that we look at are also major events such as football games and concerts and the weather that can also influence. Uh, so these are the main family of features that we look into when once we're building a new model. Uh, and 
in many examples, we have a couple of models, but in most cases, the models that actually tend to, to win uh, are uh, GBT. Uh, in this case, I'm showing XGBoost uh, prediction model in this specific example, uh, where we this is what the best model, but a lot it, it can be XGBoost or CutBoost. Um, we looked at other models, like uh, other simple regression models, uh, other tree-based models, also deep learning models, fully connected uh, models, and RNNs and LSTMs. Uh, which sometimes have one, but mostly uh, for us, it, what works best are three based models. And so that's how we uh, solve the session prediction uh, module. And then uh, moving on to the next model, uh, we need to convert the sessions to rides. So this is actually a pretty uh, interesting, uh, pretty interesting, but more basic. Uh, how we do that. So sessions to rides conversion, as I showed, uh, this is the profile of uh, the conversion rate. Uh, and in many cases, uh, what we see is that the behavior uh, of, the, of this, the dependence on the distance is, uh, is very different across uh, the areas of the city. Uh, so can anybody also take a guess, how does it change? How, how will the profile look in the inner city, in the center of the city, or in the outskirts of the city? Would you imagine that uh, the dependence on distance, how would it change? Any guesses? The conversion rate will drop as far as the closer you go to the city center where the traffic is higher. So the conversion rate will drop, the conversion in, in all, of the, all of the distances or, or where? As a function of uh, the density of the traffic, the conversion rate will drop. As a function of the distance, you mean? No, as a function of the traffic density. Is... Mm -hmm. Okay. The city okay, center so is the that... much more traffic loaded, so people tend to take less uh, shared cars than uh, actually, the, despite the fact they are looking for. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that can also happen. But what we what we actually see uh, more prominently is the fact that uh, in the center of the city, as you said, uh, people are much more uh, sensitive to the distance. And this is, it, it, I think it overlaps with, with what you're saying, because people there are much more sensitive because they have much more options. So because they have more options, they are, uh, the distance will be a much stronger factor. But in general, uh, we see that the behavior is different in the, in the city center and in the outskirts of the city. And this is why we use this profile. Uh, we just take, for each area, we take uh, a different profile. And this is how we convert uh, the sessions to rides. So that's how we do that. That's how we do the second module of taking the rides, converting it to sessions. And now we are left with the third part of actually, we have now the predicted map of demand. We, are, we know how much demand is going to be in every area of the territory and on every time, on every hour. And now we have uh, just the, the, the challenge of actually sorting, giving out the assignment, like deciding which car should go well. And this is actually an interesting uh, topic uh, we need to optimize the placement. So what we need to understand is that each placement here, what we actually want to do, we want to move the vehicles from areas of low demand to areas of high demand. And what we need to understand is this, this is not such a simple thing because first of all, we need to understand which of the vehicles we want to move and where do we want to move them. And also it's important to remember that each one of these moves has a cost. You need to actually go take the vehicle and move it. So that is what we assume uh, is a cost uh, for each one of these moves. And this is how we're going to formulate this problem. So for in order to solve this, we formulate this as a math problem, obviously, uh, being this meetup is, uh, you know, mathy. So uh, each movement of a vehicle from a placement of low demand to high demand is a task. Uh, and each uh, vehicle placed in a, in a low demand area is going to be a column. And the task can be considered to, uh, to move it to a new 
uh, area, tile is just an area, that's what it means. Uh, so moving it from tile one to tile three is moving it from a low demand area to a high demand area. And the cost of this is uh, manifested by the distance. And these are the values that we formulate within the matrix. So that's how we formulate this as a matrix. And we assume that each one uh, of that moving a, a vehicle from one place to the other uh, can be done, sorry. So moving a car from a tile of low demand uh, to the high demand is one task and each one, of the, each one of the tasks can be done by one worker. So now we have a matrix that we need to optimize. This is formulated similarly to uh, an assignment problem. So each row is uh, corresponding to uh, one column. And now we need to optimize the matrix. We need to choose, uh, to choose which value from uh, each row we take. So this is a, a, an optimization task uh, solved actually uh, optimally by the Hungarian algorithm. So that's how we formulate this problem. And this solves the, this optimization method uh, very well for this task. So that's how we solve the last part of this problem. Uh, and that's it actually. So we build a model to predict the number of sessions. We converted it to having uh, the predicted rides. And then we solve uh, the assignment problem using the Hungarian algorithm, which, uh, which gives out the recommendation of the actual moves that we want to assign to the operators of the fleet. So now we have a complete uh, pipeline recommending the moves that we want to uh, the fleet uh, operators to do on each day or hour, depending on the resolution of the problem. So allegedly, sorry, so allegedly this is done. We've built the full pipeline of the model uh, and checkmate. But actually, uh, now we need to do one of the most important things actually when you deploy a model, right? So we deploy the model and we actually get the recommendations. Now is a very important part of actually measuring the performance of rebalancing. So uh, this is obviously crucial when we want to build trust with the uh, customers because both the customers and us want to understand exactly what is the value that we actually yield to them. So we need to understand what the ROI of every move is. Uh, and this is uh, very important, especially that we understand that the, the movement themselves, they cost money. So the movements are not free. So we need to see that the revenue that we, that we actually bring is higher than that cost. But this is also uh, a problem. It's not very, uh, not very simplistic because actually we can't really run an A-B test. And why not? Because if we can, let's think about the scenario that we try to run an A-B test, we can take our recommendations and give our recommendations to half of the cars to give them and to half of them no. Uh, but this is actually not such a simple thing to do because when we move a car, it affects the entire ecosystem uh, because vehicle placement affects uh, each other. So if we have a certain area, let's think about this area. So we have three cars here. Let's assume uh, all of them need to move, or at least two of them need to move. So if we we'll, uh, assign uh, one car to actually a recommendation to move, it will affect the other cars because now the other cars who stayed in the area, sorry, have a much higher likelihood of actually being rented. Instead of, uh, instead of X percent, the percentage uh, increases when we move uh, one car from that area. So it's not a simple task to do an A-B test. So we can't do it like that. And also we can't really do a time varying A-B test because different times behave differently. And in addition, once you make a rebalancing, it has a long term effect. So it's not something that is that the value does not just come after one hour or even one day. It's a long term effect, which means that it's going to be problematic to do a time varying A-B test that like you would imagine doing an hour of a baseline methodology and an hour of our model. So this is also a problem, but uh, to our help comes reality. So what actually we see in reality is that, that when we give recommendations, 
uh, then in this case, we can give four recommendations just for the simplicity. Obviously, it's much higher than that. Uh, but some of the recommendations are not made because different reasons, like the operator uh, are uh, not unable to, to make the movements because they have under capacity or, or they just, uh, they think this area, they're not, uh, they're not going into that area on that specific day or the distance that uh, needs to be done is too big. So uh, there are many reasons that some of the recommendations are not happening. And we can actually use that data for our advantage. Uh, because now, uh, if we take uh, only, the, only the moves that haven't been, that we recommended. So we look on all of the moves that we recommended to do, and we compare those who haven't been made and have been made. And this is a, actually a really good, uh, a really good uh, way for us to get a measurement of how much, uh, how much uh, value are we creating? Because then we compare the average revenue uh, that uh, these uh, vehicles have created against the ones who haven't moved. I mean, this graph shows exactly that. The blue line shows the revenue of the vehicles that have been moved. We recommended to move and moved. And the green line shows the revenue uh, of the vehicles that have been made a recommendation for them. We wanted them to move, but haven't been moved. And this, the fact that the blue line is much higher than the green line consistently, this shows exactly the value that we're creating. So the black line is exactly that. It's the delta between these two lines. And we can measure and track the ROI of uh, the placement every day. And this is a very important uh, KPI that we keep monitoring. And it shows us that the model is actually performing well and we are on a stable grounds. Uh, so that's how we actually do the measuring uh, of the rebalancing. Great. Uh, this is a good point maybe to stop and uh, ask for any questions if there are any, although we don't have a lot of time. So there's one question uh, in, the, in the chat. Maybe you already answered it. Uh, can't uh, see the chat. Let's see. So chat. Yeah. Do, so you have a, do you follow the influence of one type of vehicle and another? I mean, if you create a, a deficit in one type of vehicle in specific area, will it create increased demand, more profitable? I'm not sure I understand this. Obviously, we talk the, uh, we talk about the the codependence of this. And this is why we treat, when we solve the assignment problem, we try to treat this as a global problem. Uh, so obviously, yeah, uh, if you move a car from a specific area, it does, uh, it does affect the other car. And that's how we take that into account. Uh, and yeah, I think what, what uh, I think this touches this question is the fact that we can see, we see that uh, in simulations that we run, that if we move cars, uh, cars that we made a recommendation to move and we look at other cars, it actually makes them more profitable. So we see this from simulations that we do. So I think this is uh, the answer for, uh, for that question. So we do see that effect, yeah. Uh, so I'll move on to, uh, to next challenges that uh, we see at Autofleet. Uh, so this was one use case. It's a really cool use case that uh, combines both data science and both optimization uh, algorithms. Uh, other, uh, other challenges that uh, we're gonna have uh, are uh, trying to frame these type of problems as uh, some kind of a global uh, framework. This is something that we're working on right now and it's uh, building like an auto ML framework. Uh, also, this can be uh, approached uh, using a global model course learning models where we have uh, one general model uh, that uh, is trained on the entire data of Autofleet and then just fine tune to the specific territory. So that's also something we're probably going to look at in the future. Uh, also uh, reinforcement learning models are something that uh, might be relevant, especially given uh, the fact that sometimes the demand is biased by the current state. So that can also be relevant. Uh, also, temporal vision models are stuff that might be relevant because we can currently we 
we look at the problem uh, using tabular data, but we can actually feed the model with stuff like the picture that you see on the right, and like a video of pictures of a heat map of the territory and try to use uh, RNNs in order to infer what the next, how the next heat map will look. Um, all of these are relevant for this specific use case and other similar use cases. Uh, and also, I didn't touch this, but we have a lot of other models that we might try to tackle, uh, especially that auto fleet uh, uh, space is related to planning of routes and stuff like that. So definitely graph models are something that we are uh, looking into. Uh, and that all of these are uh, cool new challenges that we are going to look at in the future. So feel free to, to talk to me if you have any insights on that. Thank you guys for listening. And also uh, we are also hiring. So uh, if you uh, think this could be interesting for you, you are welcome to contact me. Thanks. Perfect. Thank you very much, uh, Doron, for the super interesting talk. Uh, everybody, I hope you enjoyed the session. And again, apologies for the last minute change we had, but this is apparently the reality. So uh, stay safe and healthy uh, and see you next time. Thanks. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thanks. Bye. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.